How did a company founded in 1918 who made light bulb sockets end up making this? Let's find out as we do a deep dive and explore everything you need to know about the Panasonic GH5S. The story of Panasonic starts with a dude named Kanosuke Masushi, who I'm gonna call Kono because I'm lazy. From the 1920s to the 1960s, Kono sold various electronics in Japan, but it wasn't until he met some Americans that a light bulb went off. He realized that all us crazy Americans were obsessed with melting our brains with the television. After this revelation, Kono started making TVs under the name Panasonic. The company was a hit, and over the next several decades, Panasonic released all sorts of random electronics like blenders, fridges, rice cookers, and microwaves. Later, as consumer camcorders started growing in popularity, Panasonic wanted to get in on that action too. So they made several models like this one, this one, and this, which was actually my first mini DV camera. These were great for capturing family memories or making horrible short films like mine. But in 2002, Panasonic made the legendary DVX100. This was the camera to get if you were an indie filmmaker back in the day because it was the world's first consumer camcorder to shoot 24p. Trophy! Around that same time, Panasonic wanted to get into the world of digital still cameras. So they created the Lumix line. Under that moniker, they made several point and shoot cameras, but nothing really took off as Panasonic was late to the game compared to Canon, who already had digital cameras with interchangeable lenses. Fast forward to 2008 at Photo Kina when Panasonic released the Lumix DMC G1, a pretty solid camera with a very special new feature, a micro four thirds sensor, which was a variation on the four thirds system originally developed for DSLRs by Olympus and Kodak. The big difference with the micro four thirds system was the fact that it did not provide space for a mirror box like on a DSLR. This gave the camera a much smaller body and lens design via the shorter flange focal distance. This meant that you could adapt nearly every lens ever made onto the camera, making the Micro Four Thirds system one of the most compact and versatile systems on the market. There were some major drawbacks though. EVF and LCD screens of the time were super low quality and slow to refresh. So the good old fashioned mirrors and optical viewfinders found in DSLRs were still the best option for most photographers. Despite this, the G1 was an exciting camera for indie filmmakers because it could shoot stunning 4K video at 120 frames per second. <laughs> no, no, that's a lie, this is 2008. Are you crazy? It actually couldn't shoot any video at all. Thankfully, only a year later, Panasonic released the GH1, a video capable version of the G1, which gave it the title of the world's first video capable mirrorless camera ever. Let's give Panasonic another trophy for that. But 2009 was a very competitive year for cameras. People like Philip Bloom were gushing over the full frame 5D Mark II. And to be honest, the 5D footage looked better. Still, several indie filmmakers out there saw the camera's potential and bought the GH1. Even Philip Bloom, he got it for free, come on. Let's jump to 2010 when Panasonic releases the GH2. This model came with a handy touchscreen display, higher recording frame rates, and an 18 megapixel sensor. Filmmakers loved it, especially our very own Griffin Hammond. You know who also loved the GH2 even more? Hackers! The GH2 was already a step up from the GH1 for video shooters, but it wasn't until Vitaly Caselli, alias Tester 13, hacked the GH2 that the camera really came to life for filmmakers. That's right, it's Skynet. The hack unlocked higher bit rates, additional frame rate options, and longer record times. Stupid taxes. It was so cool back in 2013, we even made a video about it. Transition. The hacks essentially turned the camera into a monster when it came to video specs at the time. And this got even better as time went on as more hackers started playing with the firmware. Panasonic took note. And instead of ignoring the hacks or even trying to shut them down, they embraced them with the GH3. This bad boy had a much more pro body and included most of the features that the hacks unlocked. Except now it was official. The GH3 also had a much better internal codec 
and frame rate options, and could even shoot up to 60 frames per second at 1080p. Also, it had a headphone jack. That was a big deal back then. Two years and a lot of Indie Mogul videos later, Panasonic released the GH4, giving Panasonic another award on the shelf, the world's first 4K mirrorless camera to record internally. This camera was a huge deal because it brought a lot of pro video features to people who couldn't afford a cinema camera, like a RED. The GH4 was capable of shooting 4K up to 30 frames per second and slow motion up to 96 frames per second. It also included a proper log picture profile, focus peaking, zebras, and more. However, all that gooey gooey goodness came at a cost with a slightly increased crop on the sensor, giving it a 2.3x crop compared to full frame. Thankfully, around the same time, another product entered the filmmaking market that boosted the performance of the GH4. I'm of course talking about the Metabones Speed Booster. If you could afford one, the Speed Booster improved low light performance and gave you the same sensor size equivalent as a Super 35 cinema camera. Worth $600? Maybe. That sweet GH4 and Speed Booster life was good for several years, but got even better when Panasonic gave the GH4 a firmware update, enabling greater dynamic range using V-Log. Also included in the firmware update was support for true native anamorphic shooting, allowing filmmakers the ability to use vintage anamorphic lenses, which is awesome. Fast forward to March of 2017 when Panasonic released the GH5 featuring the revolutionary IBIS system, which stands for in-body image stabilization. The GH5 kept a similar body style to the GH4, but removed that annoying 2.4X crop and made it a true 2X crop. They also added an extra SD card slot and bumped the megapixel count up to 20 for those photo enthusiasts. But seriously, who's using this camera for photos? <laughs> Panasonic really didn't hold back with the GH5 and threw the kitchen sink at us by giving us 4K at 60 frames and the ability to record up to 180 frames for slow motion. In addition to those sweet new frame rate options, we also have to give Panasonic another trophy for being the first mirrorless camera to record 10-bit internally. That's right, the GH5 had the ability to record in 10-bit 422 internally to SD cards. That's a big deal, especially for having flexibility in color correction. The GH5 also improved the anamorphic mode by using the entire sensor at 4x3, giving not 4K, but 6K video. The GH5 became another staple in the indie filmmaker's kit and is still being used by several people, including us here on Indie Mogul. I'm looking at you, Griffin. But that IBIS wasn't perfect. There were some cinematographers that actually hated it because it wobbled like crazy when you put it in shaky situations like in a car or in a blender. Enter the GH5S, the GH5 for filmmakers. This camera had a plain old normal sensor that was not stabilized and added dual native ISO. This is a technology we have seen with Panasonic's film camera, the Vericam, but was another first for Panasonic. Our trophy shelf is getting heavy. The dual native ISO gave the Micro Four Thirds system really good low light performance, rivaling both Sony and Canon. The GH5S also bumped the slow motion up to 240 frames per second at 1080, but kept all the other features everyone loved about the GH5. Now it's worth noting in March of 2019, Panasonic announced their first full frame mirrorless cameras, the S1, S1R, and upcoming S1H. With the announcement of these cameras, it's going to be interesting to see what Panasonic does with the GH line. Panasonic has stated on the record that just because they are making full frame mirrorless cameras now doesn't mean they will abandon the Micro Four Thirds line. But with competition from Sony, Nikon, Canon, and now even Fuji? What? The question is, will Panasonic continue to invest in the ecosystem that got them to where they are? Or will they go all in on more expensive, bigger, heavier full frame cameras to keep up with the big boys and girls? If anyone knows, it's probably Griffin. Tweet him and ask him. <laughs> All right, everyone, that's it for this episode of Deep Dive. Let us know what subject we should tackle next. 
And if you like this episode, please subscribe and hit the bell button. I'm gonna hit this. Oh, didn't work, here we go. It's the mall.